Hi, everybody. This is Janet Belsky, and I am on to episode three of the growing up part of my Lifespan Lecture Series. And today we are going to talk about that frightening and exciting stage called adolescence, the teens. Mainly during this lecture, we're going to be talking a lot about things that you never knew about puberty. We're going to then tackle the stereotypes that we have, usually negative, about teenagers. Are they depressed? Are they acting out? Are they moody? And then finally, I'm going to give you tips and suggestions, research-based. Can you predict who's going to get into trouble as a teenager and what's actually causing teenagers to get into a lot of trouble? Now, we'll find getting into some trouble is part of the teenage experience. There was no adolescence for almost all of human history. And in fact, when you reached puberty, that was your signal to go out into the world. For instance, here we have these things called a puberty ritual, which we still have in some African nations, usually pretty gender stereotyped. At a certain time, first menstruation for women and you know, at a certain age for men, you were separated from your family and you were taken out to be taught how to be an adult. And the, ma and the male role model was, you know, you kill an animal, you become strong. And for women, it was things like, sorry to say, guys, cooking, making dinners, caring for kids. And then after that initiation, right, you got married and you had kids. And that was the way life went. And here's another example, which is the bar mitzvah. Now, who at 13 would be an adult? But that Bar mitzvah was a signal that actually you became an adult. You could learn the Torah act. Adolescence really got going in the Great Depression. Less than a century ago, the Roosevelt administration and the Congress saw all these sort of crazy teenage boys running, roaming the countryside, and they got an idea. Well, maybe let's make a law that you have to enter high school. High school enrollment actually began this in-between phase called adolescence because young people really can't become adult until they leave school and they actually begin to earn a living, which means that adolescence is a very long stage. It lasts well beyond teenagerhood. And in fact, it can be almost twice as long today as childhood. So, you know, you reach puberty, maybe sixth grade, and then you end up getting finished, ready to start your adult life around 30, because that's when you finish your schooling. And adolescence is a very long, I'm going to say artificial life stage. And we have a theorist or two that says one of the issues with being a young person is you have to be a child for longer, much longer than your body is telling you, you have to be an adult. Okay, so why does puberty start? Well, the actual signal has to do with a chemical called leptin, which reaches a certain threshold level and sets off a chain of events involving the hypothalamus in the brain, involving different brain parts, involving the gonads, which are the organs of reproduction, which are sending out messengers to reach puberty. And that process from the beginning to the end, on the average, the whole puberty process takes about five years. But the, And also the other thing about puberty that makes it a little crazy making is kids go through the process at different ages. So there can actually be almost a five-year difference in the process between, between different girls and a five-year difference between different boys. Some boys are very late other boys are early, some girls are early, and other girls are late. And who you look like before you reach puberty, as I'm not telling you anything you didn't know, is completely different than who you're going to look like when the process is done. And here we have a wonderful example of a girl, maybe she's about, let's say, nine or 10, depending on when her programming is. And when she's done reaching puberty, she's going to look like this. And her whole personality is going to be different. Puberty is a total change in your feelings, a total change in your priorities, and of course, a total change in your body. Everything from the way your hair looks, to the way your face is shaped, to the way your skin looks. It's like you became a new person. 
Worse yet, you can't really talk about that stuff with your parents because puberty, I don't know if it's biological, is set up where it's hugely embarrassing to discuss it with your parents. Embarrassing thing I ever heard of. Here we have a short snippet of a really kind of a cute example of this. Talking to kids about the facts of life, there's always been a tough people, but let's face it, our world has changed. We're now talking about puberty. What do you think? When your body changes, you become not kid, no man. Are you at a man stage yet? Oh, yeah. When you came to the bathroom the other day and you said to me you had something on your face, what was that? Oh, yeah, and that's the question. Jackson, how are you, what are your thoughts on puberty, considering you are in the midst of it? I absolutely hate it. Why? What is the pitfalls? You know, it varies from kid to kid, but pimples are the bane of puberty. In addition to all the other weird things that are happening to your body that you really can't really talk about with anybody. You have to go through this process all by yourself. Is puberty happening earlier? And that's the thing that we all agonize about. And the answer to that is absolutely. So when they began taking records, this is an interesting finding that in I'd say the 19th century, the average age, by the way, they, the average age, the marker of puberty is menstruation. And that happens late in the process, but that is a clear marker that you are in puberty. So they use that as their benchmark. And in the 1800s, it was about 16, and then it's gone down and down and down and down and down. And today, today the average age is somewhere around 12. It's actually gone down even from 2000. Why? And the major culprit is good nutrition. Nutrition is setting off the substance called leptin in your body, which is signaling the brain just unleash puberty. Now here's a kind of an interesting fact. Another environmental force, a lot of this is stuff is also your genetics, your net genetics predicts when you reach puberty, but another environmental force that is really very interesting is for girls is that life stress is also involved. There's a relationship between having a very stressful early life and reaching puberty earlier which is setting up kids actually who are having the worst early lives to actually propel them into adulthood. That's supposed to be good, but it can cause a lot of problems. Another idea that we have is girls look two years ahead, at least, don't they, in reaching puberty? So here's an example of maybe sixth grade girls. And the girls look like women, and we all know the boys look like little boys. Are they really two years ahead? And the answer to that one is not really. Things like growing tall, that's called the growth spurt, happen first in the puberty sequence for girls. Another thing that happens first is breast development. This is an early sign. These girls are not quite there yet, but that's an early sign of puberty in girls. Those are the externals, the things you can see. But this boy, it's like a baby, doesn't he? But actually, he might be reaching puberty in ways that we don't know. In boys, the first thing that happens is the growth of the penis. So girls, we can speculate in our heads for a Why is that so? But for boys, the internal stuff is happening first. And actually, statistically, girls are still ahead, but by about one year. Externals happen first with the girls. Given that we all reach puberty differently. Who is most likely to have problems? But you might be surprised to know, or maybe not so surprised when I explain it, that the people most set up to have problems are early maturing girls. So let's imagine you look like a woman. Now it's going to be like fourth or fifth grade. And here's what happens to you. You are going to get involved 
with the older boys and they're gonna be, it's very alluring to be with the older boys and or girls who are early matures are really set up to get pregnant and to get into trouble just because of their maturity timetable. And we have studies that show, and this was a study in Sweden, that the early maturing girls were more likely to get pregnant and they were more likely to have a difficult adulthood simply because they were propelled by the puberty cycle into adulthood at a time when their brains were not as well formed to say no and things like that sexually. But when really do we start to get interested in sex? Now you would think it's around the middle of puberty. And just as some of you may know that uh, testosterone is the programmer of sexual desire in men and women. But there's another androgen, testosterone's an androgen that actually starts flowing through the body earlier than puberty. So here's this classic interesting study. Turns out that the below park age of getting interested in sex is probably fourth grade. Is that weird? And these guys don't look like they could possibly be interested in sex because they're still in elementary school, but the beginning signals between these two guys are probably happening right about now. Now, you may say to yourself, well, how'd you know that, Belsky? And the answer is that we have information where they asked kids who were gay in their 20s. This is a, 20, a study that was done in the 1990s. When did you first realize that you were turned on to your own gender? And they were able to remember that because it was such an important event. It showed, boy, I'm, I'm not turned on to the other gender. It's my own gender I'm turned on to. Turned out the ballpark age was targeted at about fourth grade. So that's an interesting finding, isn't it? We get interested in sex, and then we get more interested when the testosterone gets flowing, but we begin to get interested before puberty. We're giving my source here, Lawrence Steinberg, who was a adolescent specialist, put it beautifully. He said, the pubertal brain gets activated, the social brain, before the frontal lobes, that's the top part of our brain, fully come online. So actually, puberty programs us to gallop into adult life. Isn't that beautiful? Uh, and then later on, we get more control when the frontal lobes really get finished, which turns out to be around age 25. That's a famous thing that parents are told. Now, as frontal lobes aren't mature yet, just wait. It's a reality to that. Are these classic negative stereotypes true? Are teenagers peer obsessed? Absolutely. Peers you're programmed to go out in the world and be with your peers. So teenagers are obsessed with popularity and peer success. And popularity is more important than anything else. They ask kids in sixth grade, What's, what would you like to be more than anything else? And the answer is popular. Do popular kids have the highest self-esteem? They should, after all, they're popular. As the popular kids, there's an example of these beautiful popular women. Well, now I'm going to tell you that that's not true, because when they asked about self-esteem, it turned out that the kids who were the most popular had lower self-esteem than the kids who were in the middle of the class. And my interpretation is that they're very worried about every flaw because they could fall off the popularity wagon in a minute. Being at the top of the social hierarchy, we'll talk about it when we talk about happiness, is not the way to be a happy life. And finally, does being a popular preteen predict being successful as an adult? And there, it's, it's kind of a no-brainer because the kids who are popular in sixth grade tend to be the kids that are getting into trouble. And that's not going to predict being successful as a, as, as a mature adult at all. Risk-taking. Teenagers really take dangerous risks. And of course, that's our stereotype. And of course, that stereotype is actually true. So here we have the classic teenage activity, which is jumping off buildings, taking very dangerous risks. And here we have the thing that we're most worried about, which is criminal behavior. And we all know, certainly today, that the time when you're most likely to be arrested, particularly 
this is true particularly of males, is when you're about 19 and there's a steep decline in the arrest rates. We still get people getting arrested, but if there's a decline dramatic, even by your mid twenties, in the chance of committing crimes and getting arrested. Another statistic is that when they look at boys by about 20 to 24, at least a third of them statistically have gotten arrested or into trouble with the law. And you have to be worried about teenage boys, particularly in groups, because group being popular when you're an early teenager can often mean taking those kinds of risks. Are teenagers moody? That stereotype's also true. And here's the way we determine that scientifically. This is a thing called the beeper test, where they give kids beepers. And when they gave the teens the beepers, you can see here that depending on when they actually beep them, their moods would change a lot. Here's I'm feeling pretty good right now. I'm in school and I had maybe got a great grade on a test. And now here goes up. Now I'm feeling very depressed. I felt sad, something bad happened to me in school. And then this typically happens at the end of school. It's the end of school and I'm thrilled. Moods are very much tied to your experiences but they really are more extreme in teenagerhood. And here's adults. Now you and I both get into different moods during the day but it's much, we're much more placid than we would be certainly when we were teenagers. One, is it true the teenagers, particularly females, are more depressed than other age groups. Okay, and here we find depression rates by age over the last decade. This is what we're worried about. They got higher. They didn't get higher in 30 to 40 year olds. They didn't get higher in 50 year olds, but they got much higher in the teenage years and the early 20s. And they got higher still in the mid 20s. And worse yet, we have an epidemic today at the moment of teen girls who really feel say they feel sad and hopeless right now. And that's more than half. That's the, that's the scary statistic now. And in the next lecture on emerging adulthood, we'll be decoding some of the reasons why young people really are more depressed today than they used to be even two decades ago. Some of it's social media, but it's not just social media. Bottom line, our stereotypes are statistically true, but let's keep in mind that today's teens have far different issues than my generation. In my generation, everybody didn't like the fact that we were acting out. Here's no fucks given, I love it. Uh, and we were terribly worried about teenage pregnancy. That was what bothered society. And now we're worried about depression. We're worried about teenagers being depressed, even acting out kind of moved into second place to teenage depression. And also I want you to keep in mind that young people are the reason why society gets better. Young people are our moral conscience and that's teenagerhood is when you get really into trying to change the world the issue of getting rid of guns and gun violence. It's really teenagers from you know Parkland on, but the teenagers are also propelling issues like taking care of the environment. They're the ones that are really gonna change the world in every generation for the better. That being said, what about teens that get into real trouble? Now there's a continuum, most teens do a little acting out, particularly when they're in sixth and seventh grade. You know, they toilet paper the neighborhood or, you know, they, they relish in getting into trouble. I remember when I was 13 and I said, I stole a book. I was so thrilled about myself that I had gone out and I'd stolen something, yay. And I was like, I felt like a real adult then. But then there are really bad teens who are getting into serious trouble. Can we predict who they are? And the answer is yes, we can somewhat. Now there are many, many, many exceptions, but 
it's easier to get into trouble if you are failing in elementary school because already you're not connected in the same way. Teens who are disconnected from the wider society, it's a no brainer, are more likely to gravitate to the getting into trouble group of teens. Are teenagers getting into serious trouble because they're in a bad crowd? And the answer there is kind of yes and no. As I mentioned, teens who aren't doing well in traditional ways tend to gravitate to the deviant, we call it in psychology, crowd. And the deviant crowd is going to make things worse. So here we have a group of teens. There's a guy hitting there. Hey, guy, let's, let's come on, let's steal go to the store and let's steal stuff or let's find out my city, Chicago, it's let's hijack a car. And they egg each other on in the group and they do, teens in groups are the kids who are getting into serious trouble. Teens in the bad teen group, that's our stereotype and it's actually true. So it's the group and it's your predisposing personality to get into that group. And here are some questions that you wanna ask you, how are your teenagers getting into real trouble? What might get them on the right path? Now it's not going to be you because by this age, they've moved out of the family orbit and the impact of the parents is not that important in terms of teaching. What you need to do though, is if you can do it, get the child a mentor outside of the family. That really predicts getting on the right path. So for instance, she's gonna find a mentor that helps her with something that she's always liked to do. So even if she's getting into trouble, Taking cooking classes with her mentor or even just talking to her mentor is going to really propel her in a different path. The most important thing in order to get your mentor or in order to have a good path is are you living in a nurturing community? If you're living in one of these places where there are no good peer groups, you are almost predestined to get into big trouble. And I have one of my students who was in a car. Uh, and he was in a drive-by shooting when he was 15, came from a very poor neighborhood and they put him in jail. And luckily, they put him in jail, by the way, for murder, but luckily he managed to get a mentor and get out of jail. And he is on a wonderful path right now. That happens, but you have to get lucky. You have to have the right mentor and you have to have somebody outside of your parents that's gonna push you forward into having a good life. Living in a nurturing community is very, very important in having a successful life. The community makes a huge difference as to how you're gonna quote, turn out. Final takeaway, since adolescents need to rebel to become adults, they need to separate and the brain gets more in sync as we mature. Who we are at 14 is very different than the person we're gonna be at 34 or even at 25. And if you look back to yourself, I'm looking at myself now, person I was at 14 is a little bit similar, but basically I'm a very different person than I was at 14. Frankly, let's be honest, all I cared about at 14 was having sex and I didn't care about school at all. And I'm different now than I was yeah. then. Mark Twain summed it up best. Because when I was a boy of 14, my father was so ignorant, I could hardly stand to have the old man around. But when I got to be 21, you know, and it would be about 25 now, I was astonished at how much the old man had learned in seven years. You're supposed to really separate from your parents and then come back to them when you're both adults, respecting each other as adults. And if you like this lecture, you can join me at Belsky Being Human, my website, as I draw in my half century writing college textbooks to decode what scientists know about our developing lives. Next, uh, we have one more lecture on growing up, which is gonna be the twenties. And now we're gonna, then we're gonna go to big questions in being human, intelligence, personality, and happiness. And then of course, I have lectures about my life stage which is being old. So thank you very much. And I will see you in the 20s, which is our next lecture.